So, what do we know about uh, Amber? Uh, she, uh, the sheet that uh, was prepared, um, and the topic is called Mums Stop the Harm and Failed Drug P Policies. So, what do we know about uh, the issue is that there's a crisis, particularly here in southern Alberta. So, it's a good time to be dealing with this. And Amber is a member of Mums Stop the Harm and is a social justice advocate in southern Alberta. She's had 13 years experience working in the human service field and holds a degree in psychology from U of L. She's also the co-author of I Am the Opioid, Opioid Crisis, Stories from Southern Alberta. And she's also started a nonprofit organization called Sweet Grass Youth Alliance that strives to support youth transitioning to adulthood who are involved in the current broken system. In addition to that, I don't know when she has the time to do all this, but in addition to that, she works at the college, uh, Lethbridge College, and, and uh, you could ask her about the work that she's doing there uh, for inclusion, which is a new position, apparently. So, let's start with uh, Amber, welcome her to the podium. Good morning, or good afternoon, everyone. Um, can everyone hear me? One thing, I forgot to tell you to turn off your phone. Please. Thanks, Barry, for the nice introduction. Now I don't have to really do it myself. Um, I do have a land acknowledgement. So instead of the ones that are just copy and pasted, I have a. Uh, I was at a conference last week, and I wanted to share this piece that that they used for their land acknowledgement. So it says, we commit to protect, respect, and honor Mother Earth and the natural laws of the Creator, that we will be respectful and bear true covenant to the first peoples of the land. We will seek their guidance and place the grandmothers at the center of our circle of humanity and wisdom. I fully acknowledge that I am stepping into covenant as a treaty person of Turtle Island. I accept my responsibilities to steward the land and waters to ensure there is enough for all life <clears throat> and for generations to come. So this is a brief outline of what I'm going to be speaking about. Uh, first I'll tell you a little bit about my story, how I ended up at Mom Stop the Harm, and then we'll talk about why we have a drug poisoning crisis, the role of harm reduction in the drug crisis, and the role of drug policies. And then we'll go over what Mom Stop the Harm does and I have a little bit of a final message. So I spent 12 years being a foster parent here in Southern Alberta. I took high risk youth. So they were the youth uh, between the ages of 12 and 17 that had kind of uh, started behaving or started developing behavior problems or addictions and things like that in their initial foster homes. And I had 12, um, just one at a time, <laughs> but 12 youth over the years. So this is Brett Danis. Brett was a hilarious young man who was in our home until he turned 18 when children's services wouldn't allow him to stay any longer. He had severe FASD and was eligible for PDD services, but because he missed an appointment, they closed his file. Brett couldn't read or tell time to get to his appointment. He died on the floor of the homeless shelter of fentanyl poisoning in 2015. <coughs> This is Brianna. She was a dynamic, sassy young lady who was with us until she turned 18 when children's services wouldn't allow her to remain in our home. She moved to Calgary with her boyfriend and began using opioids. She died alone in her bedroom and police aren't sure how long she was there before anyone found her. So these are two of the reasons why I advocate with Mom Stop the Harm and also why I started my own nonprofit to help um, bridge the gap between youth and adulthood, especially for Indigenous children who seem to fall through the cracks a lot more. Um, but it's easy to fall through the cracks of systems that are so broken and, and seem to be set up for these people to fail, especially young people. <coughs> so 
when we're looking at the drug poisoning crisis, it's not an opioid crisis. It's a toxic street drug supply crisis. It's not an addiction crisis. It's a crisis of trauma. And we'll talk about that a little bit later too. Not everyone who uses needs treatment. Um, substance use is on a continuum. We'll talk about that again later. And harm reduction does not increase use. It actually just helps keep people alive so that we can help them longer. Safe supply and harm reduction does not increase use. It provides a safer option to using street drugs. Why we share our stories. As I began to get to know the people who use drugs, I was very humbled by their stories and I decided to compile a lot of their stories in a book. It's called I Am the Opioid Crisis. Not meaning that I personally am the opioid crisis, but each story starts with I am. So we have like, I am a mother, I am a daughter, I am a friend. And it, it's just all stories from Lethbridge and area. It's right there. You can find it at the library or it's also on Amazon. And all the proceeds go to my nonprofit organization. So here you can see some, just a small snippet of um, the people who have passed away from the drug poisoning crisis. These are all the children of the members of Mom Stop the Harm. So substance use and overdose can affect anyone, but it affects some more than others. Indigenous people are five times as likely to die. People from all socioeconomic, ethnic, or cultural backgrounds and all regions are affected, but there's one, or one demographic that is most at risk. It's men ages 25 to 39 who use alone mostly indoors, 80%, in their own homes, 65%. And this is something interesting that I'm just learning now. Certain professions are at a higher risk. So culinary, trades, and people living in camps away from their families are dying at a much higher rate. The reasons why people use vary widely, but there are some common themes, especially for those who become uh, for the whose use becomes problematic. Um, usually it starts from a physical or a mental pain, trauma, adverse child experiences, and a lack of hope. The majority of our loved ones who struggled with substance use also had mental health issues. The next few slides are statistics. Um, so I'm not sure if that interests you. I'll go through them quickly. Drug poisoning, death in Canada. So 21 Canadians die every day. There was a total of 36,422 apparent opioid toxicity deaths between January of 2016 and December of 2022. Most deaths occurred in British Columbia, Alberta and Ontario. High rates were also observed within other regions. Uh, one of those regions is Lethbridge. Uh, most of them were young to middle-aged males and the toxicity of street drugs continues to be a major driver of the crisis. This graph shows the number of drug poisoning deaths, including all substances, per month. So you can see it shot up in March of 2023. This only goes till July. Um, I've got some more recent statistics here coming. Since January of 2016, when, when they started keeping track, 9,455 Albertans have died of drug poisoning. Um, so on the left, drug poisoning deaths in Alberta between January and July. And then on the right is uh, the number of drug poisoning deaths in Alberta just during July. So you can see that the numbers are going up, they're not going down. Um, the average number of 114 deaths is based off of this span. The 
The opioid crisis has hit Lethbridge harder than other communities. Lethbridge has the highest per capita drug poisoning deaths of any municipality tracked by the government of Alberta. The city's per 100,000 overdose death rate of 137.5 is more than double Medicine Hat's rate. Lethbridge also surpassed the opioid death rate of 94 from just January to September of this year. So from just January to September, it surpassed the rate in only nine months as opposed to like the whole year rate. So I'm not sure what we're at to date. They don't get posted until a little while after, but we've already exceeded the highest rate. I'm just gonna go back to um, the, the part where we were talking about different careers being um, experiencing higher rates. So 75% of opioid related deaths are men and 30 to 50% of those employed work in the trades. Trade and construction workers are dying at a higher rate than any other industry. For more information on this, one of the founding members of Mom Stop the Harm, Lorna Thomas, is speaking at a webinar in January, and she also produced a film uh, investigating why this happens. So how did all of this happen? You've no doubt heard about the role that the pharmaceutical industry has played, in particular Purdue Pharma, maker of OxyContin, thanks to that Netflix movie. Um, they engaged in aggressive and misleading marketing practices that have been implicated in the rise of prescription opioids in North America. So pharmaceutical industry and prescription practices have played a role, however, there are a lot of other reasons. So if you have a history of personal trauma, struggle with mental health, are facing stigma from your community, uh, poverty, lack of affordable housing, racism, lack of access to appropriate health services, so extreme North communities also suffer at a higher rate. And last but not least is the toxic illegal drug supply. 95% of all deaths are from the street drugs, not from the prescription opioids. So this talks about the effects of prohibition. So on one side you see um, the lower sort of, um, so, sorry, you're increasing law enforcement, increasing cost of illegality, and increasing the potency of the substance as you go from left to right. So beer and wine turns into spirits, turns into moonshine. Uh, cannabis turned into high THC cannabis, turned into synthetic cannabinoids. Just like uh, with opioids, it started with opium, it went to heroin, and now there's fentanyl. There's carfentanil, there's also a lot of other drugs that are just coming out that are combinations of these. So as um, you increase the enforcement, the drugs actually get harder. It doesn't help the situation at all. This is the slide I said I was coming back to about not everybody that uses drugs needs treatment. So some people, when they find out that a person they love has used drugs, they try and force them into treatment and they sort of push them into treatment. Um, for one thing, treatment doesn't work for everyone. Those that are neurodiverse really aren't affected by the kind of talk therapy that they use in treatment. Um, that's why we really promote harm reduction because it meets people where they're at and it works for everybody. So on the left, there's the casual, non-problematic use. So it's just recreational, it's casual every now and then. Oh, sorry, I forgot. Initially, there's the beneficial use. So of course, opioids do have benefits for people that are experiencing pain. They actually get fentanyl at the hospital for things like operations and um, labor. 
Um, so as you go along, it ends up being problematic where you start to see negative consequences and then chronic. So chronic dependence is the use that has become habitual and compulsive despite the negative health and social effects. A recovery-oriented system of care. So not everyone needs treatment. Um, people can use occasionally and they don't need treatment. Uh, millions of dollars have been invested into treatment beds. However, they're still facing long wait times. These treatment centers aren't reporting on their outcomes, um, especially uh, the follow-up treatment centers that can be opened by anyone, the sober living houses. They're not regulated. Too many people are still dying. Um, the improvements that we have seen is that the costs of most treatments are covered by the government. Uh, the virtual opioid dependency program has expanded and there's more access to opioid agonist treatment, which is um, suboxone and methadone. It's a, it's a way of substituting suboxone or methadone, depending on what the doctor gives you, um, substituting that for your street drugs. And it will um, lessen your urges for the, the drugs, and it will help keep you safer, but you are essentially dependent on it as well. Um, and then of course we know what the UCP has been doing, they're trying to force people into treatment. We know that doesn't work, that's never been shown to work, so I'm not sure where Danielle Smith is getting her information from. <laughs> Harm reduction has been shown to work. All of the data and all of the statistics are showing that harm reduction is the way to go. Um, so often used in the context of global health policy, Harm reduction is an approach that attempts to reduce the adverse health, social, and economic consequences. The way that we are thinking about harm reduction is to focus on keeping people safe and alive and minimizing the negative consequences. There's no universal definition of or a formula for implementing harm reduction as it demands the consideration of the needs and uni unique circumstances for every person. It doesn't condone drug use. Some people think that it encourages or condones drug use. It accepts that drug use is a reality and we need to meet people where they're at uh, simply to keep them alive because dead people don't recover, right? And the longer we keep them alive, the more of a chance there is that they're gonna enter into recovery. I have not once heard from a family that their loved ones used or kept using because of access to a supervised consumption site or other harm reduction um, programs. So here is a list. Um, I often hear the argument that the majority of people die in their own home. Now statistics vary depending on your region, but about 40 to 50% of those who die don't die at home. In the absence of safe places to use, like supervised consumption sites, people use and die in unsafe places. These are all examples of mom stop the harm, um, loved ones, places where they've died. Um, so now I'm just going to talk about uh, responding to an opioid overdose. I actually brought Narcan kits for everybody to take. You can take as many as you want. They're in the box here. Um, this is the nasal Narcan, so it acts quicker and it's, it's better stored than the injection ones. You can actually keep it in your car. It doesn't freeze as quickly. Um, sometimes you do with the potency of the drugs these days, you do need to use more than one. There's two kits in, or two um, in every kit and there's instructions, there's gloves and a mask. So please, 
I have boxes and boxes of them. Um, take as many as you can. I think it's really important that everybody has one on hand because you never know when you might come across somebody. Um, it used to be that when you came across somebody, you know, that you might just assume that they have been consuming alcohol and that they're just passed out. But these days you never know, they could actually be, they could have actually stopped breathing and they could be close to death. So, um, the first, uh, sorry, this is hard to see. Um, I don't know if I can zoom in there. Stimulation and call 911 is the first step. Um, airway is the second step. Open their airway, ventilate, so you do need to do CPR. If you're not comfortable doing that, you can wait for the ambulance, but there is a, a mask that you can put over that's in those kits so that you're not going to get their germs. Evaluate the situation. Sorry, this writing is so small, I can't even read it. I bet nobody can read it <laughs> way in the back too, but... Um, it says muscular injection of naloxone, so that's the other kind of naloxone that's often handed out. And it takes a while, so you have to sort of get the vial out and put it in the needle and you have to stab it through their clothes into their leg. That's why I prefer the nasal. Uh, a lot of people have adverse reactions to seeing a needle and they don't want to. This one's just almost like, like a drift stand. Yeah, you can hold it up if you want. There's, it's just a little, um, little plunger and you just go like this as deep as you can go into their nose. So there are some drug user safety rules that are on here too. Uh, don't use alone. That's very important. So we always encourage people if they're using drugs to not use alone. There's actually an app now where you can let them know that you're using drugs and they'll monitor you. And if they don't hear back from you, they'll contact the local ambulance. Agree with your friends that you won't all use at the same time. So kind of taking turns will, will spread out the, um, the increased risk. Have a safe observer. So to have somebody that is not using that will help monitor um, the use. Um, Testing your drugs, I'll skip over the next two. Testing your drugs is also important. Unfortunately, in Lethbridge, we don't have drug testing. Yeah. So the role of language in reducing stigma is very important. You'll notice that I never call them addicts or junkies or things like that. We always use people first language. So we will say um, a person that uses drugs or somebody that's experiencing homelessness. I don't even call people that are experiencing homelessness homeless people because it's derogatory. And the people that hear these terms, um, it, it increases their shame, right? So it increases their shame and then they just end up wanting to use more drugs. It's really not, not effective. So using neutral medical terms, accurate terminology, and people first language that focuses on the individual, not what they're doing, not their actions. So if somebody that you love is uh, using substances, it's really important to talk about it. So speak to the person about your concerns. Be f calm, factual, and don't blame or accuse. Don't make your support conditional. So don't say, well, you know, I support you, but only if you go to treatment. That's not gonna work because chances are they will um, maybe not go to treatment or maybe not successfully complete treatment. They need to know that you're always gonna be there for them. Stay prepared and respond without judgment. Inform yourself and keep them safe. And importantly, take care of yourself because it is a stressful situation. Well, so what can you do in your local community? You can support local harm reduction initiatives. 
Um, there's a few in Lethbridge, but most of them have had to go underground with the new government and with the closure of the supervised consumption site uh, that Arches was running. But we do have um, evidence-based treatment on demand. So the virtual opioid dependency program is all online, so somebody can access it from wherever they are. Um, voluntary treatment. So that goes against what the UCP wants to do, but voluntary treatment is important because nobody wants to be told what to do, and it's not successful to force somebody into treatment. There's support groups. Um, I run a support group here. I've got some handouts. It's called Holding Hope. So, speak to the mic. oh yeah, sorry. It's called Holding Hope, and it's a peer-led support group. So I have a few handouts um, on that. The power of parent advocacy. Mom Stop the Harm is a network of Canadian families impacted by substance use-related use harms and deaths. We support 3,500 families Canada-wide, and our mission is to advocate to end substance use-related stigma, harms, and death. We provide peer support and always welcome new families. So some of the ways that we engage in advocacy and peer support are that we meet with political leaders, we speak to the media and social media, we do talks and stuff like this, um, we do campaigns on decreasing the stigma and the discrimination, and we've got groups, committees, and commissions, all levels of government, as well as professional organizations, and we're doing some research projects. So the lived experience part of it is really important. There's a saying that goes, nothing about us without us. So a lot of um, the harm reduction programs that you'll see have employed people that have previously used drugs because they um, are better equipped and they have more knowledge in what they actually need, right? Mom Stop the Harm calls for the full de decriminalization of people who use drugs. The majority of Canadians actually support drug decriminalization. As you can see from this bar graph, on the left is support and on the right is oppose. The criminalization of, of drugs creates harm and stigma and it leads to people hiding their use. When people hide their drug use, they're more likely to use and die alone. It means that instead of getting treatment, some people are incarcerated, which can lead to further life-altering harms for individuals, families, and society. Mom Stop the Harm also advocates for a safer supply, which are regular alternatives to toxic street drugs. So they did do this in Vancouver for a short time. It was shut down, but it was very successful while it was running. Um, it, um, it helps people that are using street drugs transition to a known amount of drug from a rel regulated source um, so that they don't so that they aren't subjected to the dirty uh, drugs that are on the streets that they usually don't know what, what's in their, their drugs, especially when there's no drug testing in our community. It's not a treatment program and there's no expectation that they attend treatment. Here are some comments from people um, that have participated in harm reduction programs. The Stronger Together Canada um, project are two multi-year projects led by Mom Stop the Harm that aim to expand and enhance peer-led supports for families impacted by substance use. So we offer two different support groups. There's the Healing Hearts groups, um, which are for families who have lost a loved one, and then the Holding Hope groups for families whose loved ones are currently using substances. And I run the Holding Hope 
Um, I don't think there's a healing hearts right now, but if anyone's interested in facilitating, they can let me know. <laughs> we struggle to find facilitators sometimes. Okay, one minute left, I'll go quick. Mom Stop the Harm advocates for access to regulated substances, decriminalization of people with substance use disorders, harm reduction, rapid access to evidence-based treatment. So as it stands right now, you have to go to detox first and that takes a while. And then from there you have to have a treatment date which never lines up with the day you leave detox and that period in between is when a lot of people will relapse, start using again. So then they have to start back at the beginning. A lot of people don't know that you can't go to treatment unless you've been off drugs for a short amount of time. Like 10 days or something so that's what detox is for so the rapid access is really important um, it eliminates that in between time where people often struggle okay I'm so glad you're here and here are some websites that you can check out the mom stop the harm website has lots of good links and videos and educational resources and then the holding hope and healing hearts group also has their own website. And of course, we're on social media. So when a per, and this is just the final message that I wanna leave you. Um, when a person with substance use disorder presents to you, remember how hard it is to come forward and ask for help. Welcome them, thank them, and be kind. Watch not only your words, but also your body language. Check the person's knowledge of harm reduction and show them that you care. As mothers and families, we want to keep our loved ones alive and healthy as long as possible so that they can arrive at a place in their lives where treatment or abstinence works for them. Help us achieve that outcome and have that conversation. And I've got my resources. There's a few different slides. <laughs> yeah. Um, next week is uh, uh, Carolyn uh, Carolyn uh, Hodes, and she's talking about the policy. Has it changed? Okay. What is it? Do you know? It's uh, Jen, Jen. Jen Prosser? Jen Prosser is coming to speak about uh, reproductive health. Oh, okay. So that's the latest update. Um, uh, I see we've already got a couple of questions. Uh, as you remember, uh, you line up over here and state your first and last name and a quick question. And, and Amber will, she, I prepared her th and told her that this was a knowledgeable group and you weren't going to ask questions that were kind of iffy. They would be specific. So she's looking forward to doing, uh, asking, the, answering those kinds of questions. And, and uh, so I'll turn the mic over to the first uh, question person. Oh, that's the P. Okay, come up, Maria. Thank you. Maria Fitzpatrick. Hi, Amber. Nice to see you. Uh, great presentation. Uh, I do have a question, but I am doing a preamble, and I'm sorry, but I am. Uh, I had the first female federal offender to go on the methadone program uh, on my caseload. And uh, this was a woman who'd been in the correctional system for about 27 years. All of her offenses were to uh, get money to pay for drugs. And um, I was not 100% um, in favor of her going on the methadone program. At the end of her sentence, I was. Uh, she had struggled with drugs her entire, well, all in her entire adult life, but uh, she went on that program, and initially it was, uh, she had a condition uh, to do the methadone program, which is not voluntary. Uh, 
Um, however, after the third day on her uh, parole, it was voluntary, and that's another story for another time. But uh, I'm an incredible supporter of the use of methadone uh, or other synthetic drugs to get people off the street drugs. But my question to you is, what can each of us do that will help to stop the uh, drugs on the street and to help people who are uh, in that position? Thank you. Oh, okay, sure. Um, so what you can do, I put a few things that communities can do. I don't know where the slide went. Oh, there it is. Um, you can support harm reduction agencies. McMahon is a really great agency for doing harm reduction. Um, you can also just sort of change the way that you speak about people that use drugs. So we talked about reducing the stigma by using people first language. Um, language that shows that you care. Even when you see somebody on the street, ask them if they're okay. They may have been using drugs, but it doesn't mean you have to pretend that they're not there. You can make sure they're okay. Offer, so, like if they've used opioids, ask them if they want a Narcan kit. Carry them around with you. More than one if you can. <laughs> um, and yeah, re recruit people to come to our support groups, things like that. Yeah. My name is Lori Schultz. Amber, thank you very much for presenting today. Oh, really great uh, information. I've got three questions just for you to comment on things that you had brought up in your, your presentation. I'm curious about the sober houses that are unregulated. Could you speak to that? Also, testing of drugs. I've didn't know there was such a thing. If you could elaborate on that. And what research projects is Mum Stop the Harm involved in? Thank you. Okay. So the sober living houses are run by um, organizations or even just people that call themselves a sober living house and they have conditions on living there of not using substances. So already that's a condition that's really hard for people with a substance use disorder to fulfill. Um, there's there's some good ones, but there's also a lot of them that will just take a damage deposit, they'll take a first month's rent, and maybe after a couple of days, they say, oh, I suspect that you're using drugs, you're evicted, and they're back on the street. So that's kind of how they work. There's no um, like accountability, there's no guidelines, provincial guidelines. Anybody can open up uh, like a group home type of situation and call it a sober living house and collect rent from people. Yeah. And then the second question was about the drug testing? Uh, yes. Okay. So in other communities and even at places like music festivals and stuff, they'll have a little booth where you can go and say, um, I just bought these drugs, I, I was sold it as uh, cocaine or whatever it might be, and they have little computers now that will just um, test a small amount and it will come back and say oh no there's actually fentanyl in this cocaine or oh no this is meth or this is something else yeah there's little texting strips uh, we don't have it in Lethbridge yet we're trying to um, not that I know of anyways we don't have it yet and then the last question was around okay I'm not actually super familiar with the research projects but I can get back to you on that one um, yeah, can I get back to you on that? I'm not absolutely sure, yeah. How would you like to? Do you want her email? Or you I have her email, yeah. <laughs> Hi, Amber. My name's Henning Mundell. And I wonder if there are data for either Alberta or Canada-wide of... Uh, people with uh, use, starting with recreational drugs and ending up in addiction and death versus those with starting with prescription drugs and ending up with addiction and death. Are there any data? 
Um, I don't have any data with me, but I'm sure there is that data. So those are two very common ways that people end up with a substance use disorder. Um, a while back, there was a huge increase in prescriptions to opioids and then the doctor there was a huge um, sort of pull the rug out from underneath you the doctors aren't allowed to prescribe it as often there was a huge cut in the prescriptions so people were forced to find it in other places such as the streets so that does happen a lot yeah or it can escalate from like I said re recreational occasional use and then because of their backgrounds and trauma and things like that the drug use sometimes increases and sometimes it doesn't too you know or sometimes they go back and forth so my name is mark Edel. the lethbridge herald has been running ads like a big bold ad right on the front pages basically say saying in addi addiction skill and then below it says help is available in a, a website and phone number. Mm -hmm. Now these ads cost thousands if not tens of thousands of dollars if they're in all the newspapers in Alberta. So I'm just wondering, do you th what is your feeling about those ads? Do you think that that money could be put to better use? I mean, I think just about everybody knows addiction skill and I think everybody knows that there is help if you really want to. So I'm just wondering what your opinion is of these ads and they're, they're put in by Alberta Health. Okay. I personally don't receive the Lethbridge Herald. Um, sorry to the lady from the Lethbridge Herald that was here, but um, I haven't seen those ads. But I don't think that they would be super super helpful. I think that we'd like to call it a substance abuse disorder instead of an addiction too. So their language is a little off, and to try and sort of scare people into it, just like the ads with the body bags and stuff like that. You can't scare somebody into getting sober or getting into the recovery path. You have to meet them where they're at, show them that you care, introduce harm reduction strategies, and sort of help guide them. You're right when you said that people do know there's resources out there. You can get referrals from your doctor, from your counselor, you can, especially street involved people will have outreach workers that they can get in touch with so to have it in the paper probably isn't targeting a lot of the people that could really use it anyways yeah those are my thoughts about that my name is Terry Shillington and I for a moment I'd like to be the devil's advocate sure. um, you state as a matter of fact that harm I'm sorry, uh, I'll, I'll talk to you here. Uh, you state as a matter of fact that harm reduction works and that free, con free I, I'm not sure my language, but free consumption sites or sites, supervised sites, uh, save lives. Um, but that's not a universally accepted uh, conviction and, and there's a lot of people in this community and in the provincial government who are convinced that they increase consumption and uh, and in uh, substance abuse so I'm wondering uh, what research has been done around that and are there other jurisdictions be it in North America or in Australia or wherever that have experimented with this and have some evidence to to um, convince the doubters okay I'm well aware that people, um, so a lot of people didn't like the supervised consumption site being in Lethbridge, so it's, lots of people call it a safe consumption site. We know that it's not safe. People will still use their drugs. It was just supervised in order to be a little bit more safe, so we call it a supervised consumption site. There are many, many places in Europe and in BC and all across Canada where it's very successful. Um, it wasn't successful here in Lethbridge for a few reasons, but it did help save lives for the time it was here. Um, it did end up closing for other reasons, but it did help save the lives of the people that were there. The statistics and the data are hard because the people that um, are experiencing homelessness that are, are um, using and overdosing and not passing away really decreased, but there's no statistics for that. Do you know what I mean? Like, we keep statistics of the opioid deaths, but not all the opioid overdoses, it's hard to count all of them, right? A lot of them will overdose to the point where they'll just wake up and nobody knows. So, 
Um, I can get you some statistics on the the supervised consumption sites that are very successful, if you'd like. Yeah. You can send it to my email. I, I can send it to you, yeah. <laughs> um, there are a couple of more questions here, but I wondered if uh, you could answer the question about if is there information about where the uh, supervised sites have been successful th so that that kind of information could be given to Leftbridge and so on, uh, which might help us to get another supervised. Uh, yeah, that's a good idea. Um, I can include that in my slides for the next time. I know in Europe, I believe it's Belgium where the people from Arches actually went there to learn how a successful supervised consumption site was run and it's been very successful. So I can add that information in next time, yeah. I'll say my name before I forget, which I usually do. I'm Ian Hurdle, thank you. Um, I have a perspective in the 60s and till early 70s in the United Kingdom, there was an extremely successful heroin program, substitution program. But the start of the war of drugs in the US made it politically unlivable. And I don't know how it got across the Atlantic to stop it, but it did. So for me, the cost of an adult uh, dose of morphine at the hospital is about four cents. So when I look, even if they're using multiple amounts of those drugs, if we were supplying it to them, there's no profit for the dealers. And when I look at amputations now that happen because Xanax is mixed in with the fentanyl, um, so I'm trying to say, is there a way we can have a cost benefit here that decreases the police, the business problems, the use of EMS? Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you for those comments. It's very true. Uh, the war on drugs was very not successful. Uh, the war on drugs made things worse. Um, so the cost of putting somebody on opioid an antagonist theory, or agonist theory, sorry, is much lower than um, the cost associated with somebody going to treatment, going to jail, being, um, having police involvement, things like that. So yeah, you're right, it, the cost benefit analysis and it keeps the money out of the pockets of the drug dealers. So mm -hmm. that's always good. <laughs> Hi, my name is uh, Tom Muffet. Um, I have a question. It's not directly related to um, people using drugs, but um, here in Lethbridge, uh, they're trying to shut down the Streets Alive mission uh, because they're supporting people in poverty and a lot of people who might be in uh, these situations uh, because they're giving uh, giving them haircuts, uh, giving them clothing, and they're saying that this is not allowed according to uh, their development permit. Um, and I was just wondering if you had a thought on that. Um, so yeah, I'm familiar with what's going on at Streets Alive. It is a zoning issue where they were zoned as a religious establishment. And for some reason, after they've been doing it all these years, now the city is coming to them and saying, well, A, B, C, and D that you're doing um, isn't acceptable. Streets Alive provides a warm place for people that use drugs to go. They don't judge people. They let you come in. They will feed people. They do something that's called foot. Friday for people because they're on their feet a lot if they're experiencing homelessness though. Just different things like that that they're trying to uh, force them to shut down. So I don't think that they will hopefully shut down completely. Um, hopefully, and what, from what I've heard, they're just going to be moving to a different location. Um, but like I heard people say, even Jesus cleaned people's feet, and you know, like all of these things, being kind to others and stuff is part of their religious beliefs. So um, I'm not sure, I've heard rumors I'm not gonna spread <laughs> about why it's happening now, but I, I think they'll probably just find another location and let's hope that it's accessible to the people that need it. Mm -hmm. 
As a follow-up to that, uh, we have uh, a fair amount of clout as individuals and seniors, many of which we are. Uh, maybe we need to be doing something, doing a letter-writing campaign or something that would let, let the, the city council know that there's people who have differing opinions from theirs. Bev Mundell-Atherstone, thank you very much, Amber. <clears throat> As a fellow social activist, I'm very uh, supportive of the work that you're doing with Mom Stop the Harm. Thank you very much. Um, I'm very concerned with the, the morality and, uh, uh, shall we say, lack of ethics of our city and our province in terms of caring for our fellow men and women. Um, and uh, third gender people who um, tend to get into this uh, vicious circle of addiction and substance abuse. And I find the question that preceded me um, very interesting because it kind of segues into what I want to talk about. So in regard to um, uh, the bylaw infringement, the last things you were saying, Christians, Jesus washing the feet of the disciples, um, feeding one another, caring for each other, um, warming each other. It seems to me all the things that uh, are going on at Streets Alive are Christian outreach. So I don't see how that goes against a bylaw. <clears throat> but the segue is to the lack of ethics and morality of our city council and our provincial government, in particular our premier, that we don't care in a very specific way for our fellow mankind, and we allow them to freeze to death on the streets. We take down the shelters, the tent cities, and we use um, a, a club, a cudgel, on um, people who have substance abuse and are now going to take away their freedom. Uh, remember, the Freedom Convoy wanted freedom. We're going to take away the freedom of people who are addicted and force them into addiction. Uh, um, rehab. What's your question? My question is, how do you feel we as citizens can make our elected officials respond to our humanity rather than responding to some greed-oriented ethic? And here's her pope. Here's her wonderful uh, booklet, I Am the Opioid Crisis, with lots of pictures. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your comments, uh, very true. And the reason there's a lot of pictures in there is because we want to make the book accessible to people that have low literacy rates, so we found an artist from the Blood Tribe to illustrate the book. Um, so back to your question, we, um, there's a lot we can do, I mean, by voting, that's a really great thing. The next time we vote somebody into office, maybe it should be somebody that cares a little bit more. Um, by attending the city council meetings, a lot of them are open to the public. If not, you can go online, you can read the minutes afterwards. But you're right, in our community there's a lot of racism, there's a lot of discrimination, people are very... I'm not making a huge generalization when I say they're very nimby, so not in my backyard. Oh, maybe that's fine over there, but as long as it's not over here, right? So by sharing my story and by Mom Stop the Harm sharing their stories and by writing books like that and sort of being more out there in the community, we hope to increase awareness and sort of decrease that stigma. So we are always looking for volunteers. That's another way you can help. Hi, Sarah Amys. I actually don't have a question. I do have some information. So the Streets Alive issue is going to council on December the 21st. Next, it's a th couple of Thursdays from now. Sorry? No, it's going to 
policy committee, right? Thanks, Belinda. But anyway, it is going to that um, body, and it is open to public. Um, and so folks are folks are certainly welcome to to go down and express their opinions. And I see Belinda's coming up to correct all the misinformation that I have just given you. <laughs> so apologies. <laughs> While she's still coming up, don't forget there are oodles of these in the box and there's these brochures as well. So let's all of us make sure we take some of these and, and use, distribute them to friends and people and carry some with us. Okay, Linda. Thank you, Amber, for all the information. I w it's not a question. I just have to correct the misinformation. It is going to Subdivision and Development Appeal Board, which is a quasi-judicial board. It is not going to council. Council has no say in this. That's where the appeal goes. Subdivision, Development, and Appeal Board is a group of volunteers. So if you do go to the hearing, give your say but remember these are just people from the community treat them nicely they are volunteers and they have a very difficult job to do and being as quasi judicial they have it's going to be very legal what they have to do they have a process to follow so i do encourage everyone to go that day have your say listen to the process uh, but please treat the volunteers nicely at that you can say what you want about council we got elected in but treat those volunteers well please I, I think we need to soon wrap it up, but I need to c cover up uh, the things I forgot. Uh, thanks to Ryan for his persistent uh, availability to, to tape us and, and all, all that that means. Uh, thank you for coming. Thank you for those of you who supported the cafeteria and, and bought their food. Uh, that uh, beef uh, soup was really good. A little salty, but very good. Uh, uh, and so thank you uh, for being here and for being concerned about the community. And I hope you will take these uh, uh, kits and uh, familiarize yourself with them because who, you don't want to have to familiarize yourself with it when you see somebody laying on the ground. So check it out first so you know what to do with it. And there's brochures too to take and so pass them on uh, to your friends and family and so on. Uh, any other thank yous that I forgot? We, I can't thank the Herald person because I think she's gone. But anyway, uh, thanks yes, to... Anderson. Pardon? Yes, thank Amber. Oh, I can thank Amber. Of course, I was going to do that. <laughs> but <laughs> Oh, and the university for their support to us. Thank you. Uh, uh, this, this is what happens when you get older. So don't get older. Uh, that, that's the solution, except you don't want to die. So I guess you have to get older. <laughs> so thanks, Amber, very much. Uh, and I'm sure, she, uh, I'm sure she'll ha she will be open to some individual conversations, too, if you have them. Sure, yeah. Oh, yes, the take-home message. I told her about it ahead of time and then forgot again. OK. <laughs> Um, my take home message is just thank you for having me here. I was really nervous. Uh, thank you for listening to my story. It's a little bit personal at the start, so it's hard for me to get through, but please take some naloxone home and please get involved in your community. Every little bit helps, it adds up to big changes. So thank you.